Hi, everyone. And my name is Angela May Bambury, and I'm a senior lecturer in housing and neighbourhoods in the Department of the Natural and Built Environment. And I'm part of the geography and environment and planning team. So I'm here to explain a little bit about my research specialisms. Um, my main passion is housing and neighbourhoods. And I've been researching those uh, two things for uh, many, many years since the beginning of my academic career, based on my experiences when um, I was in housing practice, when I used to um, manage yeah, a young person's homeless hostel and um, for young people leaving care, as well as a period of time with Shelter, the housing charity and Nottingham City Council homelessness department. Um, but for the last um, three decades, I've been researching housing and neighbourhoods. And a particular passion of mine is what's called life history, sometimes called oral history. It hasn't really got a lot to do with history per se. Um, as some of you may know, um, History comes from the French word histoire, which also means story. So when we tell our own story, what we're really communicating is our life history, our personal history. So as I say, my main area of expertise is housing neighbourhoods. I'm really interested in communities. I run the Finally a Sustainable Regeneration Practice module, which is very much to do with communities. I'm researching multi-generational housing where two generations or more share the same roof. And um, so that's a current um, research project of mine. Um, I'm also researching the housing pathways of the Irish community in both England and the USA. So that's something I'm writing about at the moment. Um, and I'll give you some details on my published papers on various themes at the end of the, this presentation. But I'm, I'm really interested in using um, life history, which is really inviting people to relay the stories of their lives, often compressed into um, shorter interviews. Sometimes they can, these can be really long interviews. So is that people, ordinary people, are placed at the center of their own stories. Um, they are the protagonist, they are the key actor in their own stories. Um, I find people inspiring. I find everyday experiences and the sorts of challenges that people have had to overcome inspiring. A lot of the research I've been doing in the last four or five years has linked people's life experiences and what happens to them in terms of housing and other outcomes to social capital, that sort of person, that network of social relationships that enable um, things to happen that facilitate certain outcomes for us. I'm also interested in um, the neighborhood level and the extent to which at the local level, we see spatial inequalities on an everyday basis. And that of course is manifested most um, um, obviously with street homelessness, but there are many other factors that look at and indicate spatial inequalities at the local level. So housing pathways I mentioned um, earlier, that's looking at the different places where people have lived over the years, why they've moved and what is it that's triggered that, that move um, and what that's meant for different households over the course of their lifespan. So th those, are th those are the particular areas that, are, that I'm interested in. These days, I'm primarily a qualitative researcher. At the beginning of my career, I did a lot of quantitative research. I'm still quite happy to dip my toe into the water of quantitative research. Um, and I particularly like using mixed methods um, when approaching a research project. I'm doing some research at the moment, which is gathering the life histories of the people in the iconic neighborhood of Hell's Kitchen, which is located in um, Midwest Manhattan. Um, and for that, I'm using uh, uh, multimedia platforms, including digital mapping, to chart the, the history of the neighborhood and to track the different um, ways that that neighborhood has been occupied over the years, having reinvented itself from a notorious neighborhood to an iconic neighborhood that commands um, very uh, high money in terms of real estate values. So going back to this passion of oral history, life history, as I say, it's not really got anything to do with history per se. I mean, we all are, uh, we can all write our own personal histories. But um, some definitions here for you, which may help. Um, using um, this method to um, collect information that we get from people orally through them speaking to us about it, 
um, for the purposes of historical reconstruction. So to find out from people themselves what has happened to them over the years, and particularly to look at the meaning that people assign to these events. So it's not just this happened this and that happened that. And often people don't relay their stories in a chronological way in any event. They jump all over the place. One memory could trigger another memory, um, uh, which can open up a whole realm of thinking. And this is a topic that I also cover in my Place Memory Meaning module, the way that we memorize things, the way that the memories of, as a process works, and the way that we understand events of the past when they're contextualized in the present. And that's a very important part of life history research. Um, all history is sometimes referred to as eyewitness um, research, where you're interviewing people to inviting their personal testimony um, of expression. Um, they were people who may have been um, observers of things, they may have been bystanders of things, they may have um, experienced things personally them, that themselves, placing them in the optimum position to be able to communicate that to, to us. Um, uh, Richie says, Donald Richie says, um, um, memory is the core of all history, but simply oral history collects memories and personal commentaries of historical significance through recorded interviews. So if you were doing an oral history interview, an oral history type interview, or an interview informed by some of the principles of oral history, because it, there are different ways that you can uh, conduct oral history, you would sit down with someone with a, a your research brief, and you would invite that person to talk um, about the experiences that they've had. And as an interviewer, when you're doing this sort of research, you tend to say very, very little indeed. Um, you sit and you listen to what the person's saying and really hear, more than listening, really hear what, what the person's saying um, with minimal in interjections. So any questions that you ask are open-ended questions. Tell me about your first memory of home. How long did you live there for? Then where did you move to? What are your enduring memories of that particular home? Those kinds of things. So I think we're beginning to get the sense of what this is. I think I'm really interested in oral history and storytelling because it reveals things um, that are untold stories. These hidden voices, people who's, um, whose stories have become marginalized or consigned to um, these sort of niche areas, people who seldom have a chance to have a platform. And I think it's really important that everyone in research has a chance to express themselves if they want to, of course. Um, so this is a, it's a very, for me, it feels like a very democratic method of research because you're, rather than it being top down or analyzing government policy, which is very important or analyzing a set of statistics, which of course in themselves tell a story, but this is very much about giving people a free reign and a free platform to um, to tell their own story on their own terms in their in their own way. So it's sometimes what we call bottom up. It's coming from people, from communities. You can have oral histories of communities, of neighborhoods, of organizations even. In fact, Sheffield Hallam two or three years ago did something which I uh, emailed the organizers of this at the time and said, you know what you're really doing there is oral history. So, um, you know, so it can take many, many different forms. Um, but what is brilliant, I think, about this research method is because you give the interviewee the platform, um, the data that you get is incredibly rich. I mean, it's, I think, as rich as any qualitative data I've seen really in the social sciences. Um, and you can use a lot of inductive techniques to think, to look behind the words and, and, and what the person, the meaning that the person was assigning to those words at that particular time. One of the exercises that I run in my workshop is I, I, I get you in pairs and I ask you to think about um, what your favorite place is anywhere, could be virtual, could be, could be physical. Um, and then I ask one person to ask the questions and the other person to answer them. And the person who's asking the questions needs to listen really, really carefully. Um, when you're recording um, interviews, you can use your smartphone app, um, which is very good. Um, just keep an eye on the memory because sound files, as you know, do take up a great deal of memory. So get them off your phone as soon as you can and, uh, and send them to yourself using a data uh, transfer program. 
Um, and I've used this technique to very good effect um, across a range of projects, things like housing pathways, housing histories, as I mentioned before, with immigrant communities. I've used this technique in China. I've used it to look at energy in um, Australia and more closer to home in Wakefield in the Airedale estate. I've used it to look at the history of the Irish community in different parts of the world. And it is readily transferred, transferable to pretty much every, every research context where you would be interviewing a member of the public to try and capture a, a kind of a very rich sense of how life was, how life felt, how life was experienced. And then looking at the different ways that people um, frame that. And then with your set of interviews, you look at what common themes are coming up. And that is, as, yeah, as I said, a truly inductive method where you let the data rise from the page and you let, you let the data do the talking for you. And that, is, that really helps to shape your subsequent analysis. Um, so I've just popped up here some, um, some of the research papers that have come out of the oral history work I've been doing recently. There are a few more to add on to that, in fact, from the last year or two. Um, but as you can see from this, it, it's a very diverse method. And I'm pretty sure that if, if any one of you are interested in looking at that kind of that very, that very sort of detailed um, um, look at someone's perception of a neighborhood or of um, experiencing, for example, you know, regeneration over the years or how an estate has changed or stigmas of social housing or there's a vast range of different ways that you could use oral history, then please do get in contact with me. So this sort of research method will be of most interest, I'd say, to people who really love qualitative research, who really love listening to what people say, hearing what people say, and genuinely giving your interviewee the floor to express uh, um, what their own experience is using their own terms in their in their own way. So I hope that's been that's been a helpful overview um, of what oral history, eyewitness accounts, and storytelling is. Um, I hope to see you at my workshop, which is in the next few weeks. If anyone has any queries meantime, then please do get in touch. And I hope that this research method has struck a chord with you on one level or another. And do let me know if you have any immediate questions. Meanwhile, um, I hope to see you at the workshop or if not there, um, sometime in the near future. And I hope everyone's doing well and you're enjoying your second year with us here at Hallam. So look forward to seeing you soon. Take care, everyone, and bye for now.